So hello from the 84th Cold Spring Harbor Symposium on Quantitative Biology. This year it's focused on RNA control and regulation. My name is Anke Sparmann. I'm a senior editor at Nature Structural and Molecular Biology. I'm delighted to be joined today by Sammy Jeffrey. Thanks for being here and taking mm -hmm. the time. So Sammy is a Greenberg Star Professor at Cornell's University Vail Medical College in Manhattan. And his lab combines both tool development using synthetic and chemical biology approaches and applies these approaches to questions of RNA biology. So the meeting just started yesterday, so we have not yet had the chance to hear your talk. Okay. But maybe you can give us a quick peek, sneak peek preview to, uh, to what you're going to be talking about okay. later on tonight. Okay. Well, I'm going to talk about our work on RNA modifications, and in particular, methylated adenosine. Mm -hmm. And methylated adenosine, especially when it's methylated on a certain position called, uh, on, on the nitrogen in, in adenosine, is called M6A. That's the abbreviation for this methylated adenosine. This is a modification that occurs in mRNA, which we, you know, we normally don't think of mRNA as containing that many modifications. Mm -hmm. We think of tRNA and other things as having modifications. But it, can, it, it is a modification that occur, occurs in mRNA, and it was discovered way back in 1974 when scientists were beginning to understand uh, how mRNA was formed, mRNA capping and other phenomenon were mm -hmm. formed. And when they were doing metabolic labeling to study the, the M7G cap on mRNA, oh, yeah. they ended up inadvertently discovering that there were actually methyl modifications inside mRNA. And, in, and with some clever biochemistry, they figured out it was um, M6A. And the people who did this were Don Kelly and, uh, and, and uh, Robert Perry at Fox Chase and mm -hmm. Fritz Rotman and other researchers like Jim Darnell, some of the pioneers of molecular biology, were involved in discovering this modification. And even though it was known since 1974, it was known to be low abundance. Mm -hmm. Most of mRNA is composed of A, C, G, and U, mm -hmm. but a tiny bit, maybe one in every 300, 400 adenosines was methylated based mm -hmm. on their analysis. Yeah. Even though that was discovered way back then, almost nothing has been known about what its function could be. And it's very appealing to think that it might be a modification like phosphorylation is for proteins mm -hmm. or you know all these other protein modifications. And so the, the potential that it has some sort of regulatory function you know, has sort of been lost and it's for many reasons. I think first, some people didn't even think that this modification was really in mRNA. Because when you purify mRNA, you actually have a lot of contaminants. Mm -hmm. And they thought maybe it could have been from tRNA or ribosomal RNA. But people like Jim Darnell did experiments where he did exceptionally high pur pur purification, at least to the ability that they had at the time. And they still were able to see it. So there was belief, but still controversy about whether it was really in mRNA. But then the other thing is, how do you study it? M6A yeah. behaves exactly like A, adenosine, when you do reverse transcription. So mm -hmm. if you take mRNA and you make cDNA, which is the first step in molecular biology, you're, you're gonna lose any methyl marks that were mm -hmm. there. And you know, a lot of people abandoned the field and people quickly moved into splicing because that was discovered in the end of the 70s. And um, a lot of this was lost and it wasn't even in textbooks. Mm -hmm. But there were a few researchers who stayed on and they cloned the enzyme. Fritz Rotman at Case Western was, mm -hmm. was really the pioneer who cloned the enzyme. It's called metal 3, methyl transferase like enzyme 3. Mm -hmm. That's the methyl transferase. And then, as with so many other things in molecular biology, the breakthroughs came from yeast and plants. You know, Someone knocked out the enzyme in yeast and they found this very remarkable sporulation defect. And in mm -hmm. plants, they found seeds would go to one stage of development and stop. And that was Rupert Frey's paper in 2008. And when we saw that paper in mm -hmm. 2008, we, we were just completely shocked by, first, we never even heard of this modification. Yeah. And so um, I, I had a postdoc who started shortly thereafter. Her name is Kate Meyer. She's now at Duke. I said, you know, we need to figure out what, what is this M6A? Is it really an mRNA? Where is it? Mm 
Yeah. Which mRNA? All mRNAs? I mean, it could have been like the cap where every RNA has it or a tail, or it could be selective. Mm -hmm. We had no idea. But that paper in, uh, related to seed development told yeah. us that the effects were precise. The cells didn't just die. They had a mm -hmm. very specific, and the yeast data, which had come out in 2002, we didn't see that, but we saw the 2008 study. Um, that really showed us that there was some connection between developmental and, and cell fate decisions, sporulation and seed yeah. development. They're all developmental type processes. So we wanted to figure out what was going on. And that was you know, when we applied for our first NIH grants on, on this topic. And we eventually, using antibodies that bind M6A, mm -hmm. and there were antibodies that were being developed for other purposes to study DNA methylation in bacteria mm -hmm. and things like this. So we got those antibodies and we pulled down mRNA fragments and it turned out those antibodies bound very specific regions of mRNAs, which are the regions that have mRNA M6A in it. And we were able to identify the specific uh, transcripts in the transcriptome that have it. And it turned out to be very specific. It mm -hmm. wasn't every transcript. Mm -hmm. It was very specific transcripts. These transcripts tend to have very unusual features. They tend to have huge exons. Okay. And those exons, we think, are the trigger for the methylation. And they tend to occur in transcripts that encode regulators of cell fate and development, ah. just like had been predicted from the work in plants and yeast. And um, so even though we know now which transcripts have M6A based on the original mapping studies the, um, from 2012 and some you know, newer methods that we've developed since mm -hmm. then um, to really pinpoint the exact adenosine residue, the functions of M6A are still not completely clear. Mm -hmm. Jim Darnell's great great work in, in the in the 70s showed the first and even now most well established function, which is that m transcripts that have M6A are not as stable as transcripts ah. that don't have it. So M6A is a mark for instability. Okay. But besides this function of of, of M6A controlling mRNA stability, a sort of logic or way to think about what the purpose of M6A and how M6A transcripts are handled in the cell isn't quite clear. And that's kind of the focus of my talk today. Okay, and is there any idea if, if the mark is dynamic? So is it removed and um, put there? Or yeah. is it more uh, once it's there, then it becomes... Yeah. So this is the source of a great deal of controversy and debate, <laughs> and a lot of people have different opinions on this. So let me just say, first at the outset, Methylation patterns are very similar in almost every tissue. Okay, so that's but there are there may be subtle differences, but the vast majority of modification seems to be the same, which would be which would go against the idea of some sort of dynamics and, mm -hmm. and all this other kind of stuff. As I said, the ability to be methylated seems to be hardwired based on gene structure, based on the size of the exons. Again, the exons are the same size everywhere because right. they come from the same DNA, right? Yeah, yeah. So it, it doesn't seem that that there is dramatic dynamics, mm -hmm. but there may be subtle dynamics. There is evidence for an eraser protein called ALK-BH5 mm -hmm. that does demethylate M6A. It's highly enriched in testes. Mm -hmm. Animals deficient in ALK-BH5 are completely normal, so that does imply that uh, most cell types don't need it, but testes and other germ tissues are abnormal. Mm -hmm. So it may have specific roles, but it may not be general. One thing that is interesting is ALK-BH5 is upregulated in certain cancers. So it could be that these patterns of modification, which we call the epitranscriptome, mm -hmm. that the epitranscriptome could be shaped to some degree by demethylation. But most of the pattern of M6A seems to be constant and fixed. Mm -hmm. And M6A therefore marks a set of transcripts that can be regulated in a specific way, but that regulation is, 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 is going to occur on the same transcripts in, in, in most tissues if those transcripts are expressed. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to understand what if there's a logic behind how these transcripts are, are being regulated. And the, the core thing that I'm focusing on today is when, is what we discovered by just looking at the M6A binding proteins. Mm -hmm. So Gideon Rakavi in, 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 in his lab in Israel discovered the M6A binding proteins. There are five of them, but 
uh, three of them are in the cytosol. They're called the YTH proteins. Mm -hmm. YTH is the name of a domain that binds M6A. There's five genes in the genome that have YTH domains. The YTH proteins that are in the cytosol are almost identical. They're paralogs. Mm -hmm. they, they may have an identical function or a redundant function or a very similar function. But when you look at them, they basically are 450 amino acids or so with a YTH domain and just glutamines and glycines and mm. pretty much nothing else. Mm -hmm. And normally proteins are filled with interesting domains that tell us about what their function is, but this is just filled with these, um, these fairly monotonous and uninformative sequences, which, were, which researchers are starting to realize now are actually biologically meaningful. Yeah. These sequences, you know, they, sometimes people call them low complexity domains, mm -hmm. intrinsically disordered sequences. That's what this protein is almost primarily composed of. And when we just started purifying this protein, and we just looked at the protein under the microscope, at first it was a clear solution, just like proteins are clear solutions mm -hmm. usually. But then we started to see little droplets form within the buffer. I and it see. turns out that the, the microscope lamp was warming up the buffer, and it's a temperature-associated phase transition. These proteins go from a solution state, mm -hmm. where they're just floating around as maybe monomers, but mm -hmm. then they come together as droplets within the buffer, so it's a droplet within liquid, mm -hmm. due to the temperature, temperature being changed. And the temperature, you know, would get up to 30, 33, 34, not okay. too warm. I mean, it's getting near physiological temperatures. We realized that all of these cytosolic M6A binding proteins, which as I said are nearly identical, do this. They undergo this phase separation, and it's regulated by salts and temperatures and other things. So that's interesting. But the more interesting thing was when we diluted this protein, mm -hmm. so it did not form these little droplets, and then added methylated RNAs, these proteins quickly form droplets induced by the RNA. Okay. So the RNA triggered the phase transition, and it turns out largely what my, what, what my talk is going to show today is that M6A's function is to drive these proteins to undergo phase separations. And these proteins now, with RNAs bound to them, partition into these naturally occurring phase separated structures that cells have, like these are called P bodies mm -hmm. or stress granules, and even other types of structures like the neuronal transport granules. What we find uh -huh. is these structures are highly enriched in M6A modified RNAs, and M6A acts as a targeting signal because of this phase transition property, because phase transitioned structures can easily partition into these larger naturally occurring droplets. They are then uh, driven into these structures. And the function of M6A, and frankly, the reason maybe why some of these genes may have lo long exons is to encode M6A to ensure that the transcript then gets handled or triaged to different mm, parts of the cell. Now, in some cells, when they're tri triaged to P bodies, these RNAs are probably degraded, where you know, P bodies have a role in degradation. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so the uh, they may not be the actual sites of degradation, but they may be, you know, the, the part of the process of the degradation. In other cells where there's stress, where you form these stress granules, which are protein RNA complexes, those are filled with methylated RNAs, and the methylated RNAs are disproportionately trafficked to those structures. And in RNA granules and neurons as well, again, we see that both the M6A binding proteins and the M6A RNAs are enriched in those structures. So I think what our work is telling us is that M6A is a signal that directs RNAs to specific structures, and it does the directing through these phase transition pathways. Mm -hmm. So that's how specificity is, is conferred upon the directionality of these transcripts by causing these RNAs to phase separate. And by causing them to phase separate, then they can get to their specific target sites, like these P-bodies and stress granules, which as I said, are themselves uh, sort of liquids within a cell. Yeah. And liquids can then fuse with each other and then um, accumulate and concentrate in specific areas. And do you think there's any specificity in that? So like you were mentioning that some go to P-bodies, others might go to stress granules. Yeah. So is that somehow encoded? In yeah. 
Yeah. And maybe the binding protein yeah. or the RNAs themselves. Yeah. Well, so I think this is going to be the big question. How, how can this process be regulated? Now, the partitioning behavior of proteins when they, first of all, when they undergo phase separation, but then when they partition, is something that people don't fully understand. Mm -hmm. But these low complexity domains, they're not just glutamine glycine. Some are arginine rich, mm -hmm. some, some are enriched in, in aromatic residues like tyrosine. So there's actually a code associated with these, you know, uh, low complexity domains that we don't fully understand. And these domains can also be phosphorylated and, and have other modifications which can further change their properties. So I think when the YTH proteins, when they bind and they have the low complexity domain with a certain set of modifications, they will partition maybe to P bodies, but then when phosphorylated or modified in some way, then they partition maybe to other structures. Mm -hmm. And so that, the, and, and so I think fundamentally, our ability to understand phase separation principles mm -hmm. and the specificity with which uh, these phase separation principles allow proteins to go to one compartment versus another will ultimately determine when M6A has a destabilizing effect, when M6A has a translational repression effect, or other types of effects that have been seen in the cell. Yeah, so the specificity comes not from the marks itself, yes, but then... Um, absolutely. That's definitely something that I think the field is starting to uh, um, believe that the specificity is coming from the proteins that recognize the M6A mm -hmm. and how they are regulated rather than the M6A marks themselves changing. But that being said, there may be a, some transcripts that will have altered methylation. Of course, but yeah. probably at the level of the proteins that bind it, that, which are sometimes called the readers of M6A, yeah. those readers may be regulated. And, tr and now, it, with, thinking in the framework of phase separation, um, now that we had that framework to understand how, how these proteins behave and what I think is their fundamental physical property, we can start to see how these modifications change their partitioning behavior and that might allow us to make predictions about what they would do to the methylated RNAs that they're binding to. Mm. That's very interesting. I'm looking forward to your talk already. Thanks so much mm -hmm. for taking the time. And yeah, we have a very interesting poster session to go to as well. So maybe we'll think, think mm -hmm. a lot.